this is what we need as a community because we are a community. We need to embrace all of the individuals who are performing what I believe to be the ultimate act of patriotism, sacrificing themselves, their time, their capital, very often their privacy and their families to run for high political office. Does it mean we don't celebrate the folks who are also running at the school board, the water board, the city council? As evidence earlier in this show, those roles are critical. And we will have a number of those candidates on as the year goes forward, as we run into the midterms and as we approach the national elections, which are only a couple of short years away, believe it or not. But right now, in terms of party building, messaging, philosophy, it's all about, I'll call it bang for the buck. How can we get in front of them the biggest group of people possible. How can we advance our message in this midterm election that folks understand that we pull back the curtains for the libertarian movement? That we become myth busters. That we dispense with the cliches, the gross generalizations, the misinformation that is perpetuated and perpetrated on the libertarian movement by the duopoly, by the Republican and Democratic parties who are completely absent of any core philosophy and are unwilling to tolerate anyone who has one. The Libertarian Party is the single biggest threat in America to the power structure that currently runs our country. Let me repeat that. We are their single biggest threat. Millions of Americans voted for libertarian candidates in the national elections last fall. Millions. That is a wake-up call to all of them. They seek to diminish us. They just seek to discourage us. They play upon our worst fears. We must not allow that to happen. As someone who describes himself as a recovering pragmatist, and as someone who is moving more rapidly towards a more radical interpretation of the libertarian movement, as someone now who somewhat defines himself loosely as a medicist, it's critical to me that we as a party, as a movement, not obsess about our own internal differences, where we stand in our own libertarian journey, but to take the opportunity now, fresh off of the national election, when our visibility was raised to the highest level in our party's 40-year history, that we take this opportunity to bring candidates like our next guest to the fore so that they can explain a clear, as I say, cogent vision for what a truly libertarian society means to the individual here in America, both in their personal rights, their right to self-determination, and their own futures. So, as a, as a, after a long-winded run-up, I want to introduce to the very first time here to the Coalition Radio audience and to hopefully eventually the Libertarian Nation at well, Pete Warren. Pete is running for to be governor Six. of the great state of New Jersey. Pete, welcome to the Coalition. Pat, hey, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me okay? You are, you're, you're, you're great. You're right on target. Pete, you know, first off, I, I just got to gotta say, because I know folks in New Jersey are either listening now or will be in the coming days. At the na last national convention in Orlando, one of the highlights for me was the introduction of New Jersey by the young woman during the presidential roll call. I didn't catch her name, but as myself, full disclosure here, as a native son of the Garden State, as a refugee from what I still consider the home country. Full disclosure, exit 138. <laughs> All right. Whoever she was. All right, I'm up around 145 up there in that area. All right. Whoever she was, if someone's got a tape of that, please get that to me. Because that was, you know, that was just, to me, it was a moment that everybody had, we just had a blast. She was funny. Are you talking about when she apologized? Like, I'm sorry? Is that what you're saying about I, I think so. It was just, it was, it was hysterical. And I'll tell you, it popped the pressure out of the room like a balloon. It, it, was, it was libertarian fabulous. So uh, pl please, whoever she is, get us, get us a, a recording of that. We, we need that here. Okay. I'll try, I'll try to do that. I, I think that was Jay's daughter. Jay's our, our vice president. 
of membership for the NJLP. And I think his daughter was, was the one that actually did that announcement. I'll find out for sure. I'll, I'll confirm that. All right, buddy. So anyway, so, let's, so again, welcome to the coalition. First of all, are you ready to become the next Chris Christie? Oh, <laughs> please don't compare me to him. The next Chris Christie. No, absolutely not. I could, you guess, you could identify me as being like an anti Christie. How's that? How, how about, I'm thinking of a campaign photo op here. How about you in Bermuda shorts, all right, um, on, a, on a lawn chair in the, at an empty beach with pictures of state policemen? Behind you, making sure that the populace doesn't get you at a closed beach. How about how about that for a campaign ad? What do you think? <laughs> All right, I can send you some more like beach photos of me if you want. To flash them up there. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. But talk to us first of all. Give us a little bit of inform your background. What I always ask every candidate that comes on: tell me what your libertarian moment was, that eureka moment when you woke up one day and realized that you were in fact you're at row, a libertarian. And uh, just kind of give folks a snapshot for Pete Rowan. I don't think it was really a discreet, like, on-off switch that happened with me. Mm -hmm. It was a natural progression that I think a lot of libertarians go through. As a young man growing up in New Jersey, I didn't really identify with policy. My, my parents were, uh, uh, they were Democrats. And I learned to become a Republican earlier on, like when I was 17, 18 years old, mostly because my parents were Democrats and I'd rather, like, go in the opposite direction. Um, you know how kids go that way. But anyway, my first real introduction to like libertarianism was um, during Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. I was a rifleman in the United States Marine Corps. And oh. while Re Desert Storm was happening, well, just before that, we had a commandant of the Marine Corps. His name was General Al Wright. He was another guy from New Jersey, by the way. The commandant of the Marine Corps at that time, he had instituted what was called a reading list, the record suggested list of readings for each rank to help them prepare for the next rank. And there were hundreds of books on this list. I noticed as a young Marine that one of my, uh, one of our, the most noted generals in the Marine Corps history, his name was General Smedley Butler, none of his writings were on this list. That prompted me to go out of my way to look for any of his writings. And just so like, if anybody doesn't know who Smedley Butler was, Smedley Butler was a general in the Marine Corps. He's the only Marine officer to have ever won the Medal of Honor twice. The man was incredibly popular during his time. He could have easily been elected to president. He was probably, in his time, more popular than Norman Schwarzkopf or General Mattis, all these other generals combined. He could have easily been president, but did not run for office. Anyway, I noticed none of his books were on this reading list. So I went out and I looked for these books. <clears throat> and while, during that, sort of what's going on, I'm trying to kill some time, and I actually get my hands on a copy of what was called, the book that he wrote was called War is a Racket. And unbelievably, one of the most highly decorated generals of all time in the Marine Corps wrote an anti-war book. <laughs> now, prior to this, you have to understand where my mindset was. I'm a young man. Now, my father had died when I was a little uh, younger, um, and I had a lot of aggression in me. Um, I was a, a young man looking for direction in life. My older brother was the type of person who was looking for, he wanted to go to, to find a career in the military, but never could, but sort of guided me towards it. I, I started, like, I was enlisted in the reserves, going to college at the same time, I was going to officer candidate school at the same time, so I was seeking out a, a commission in the Marine Corps. I was looking to become a professional Marine. And anyway, getting back to during Desert Storm, I read this book, of War is a Racket, and it absolutely changed me. I went from being someone who was a, I guess, a war hawk, to someone who looked at people as human beings. Someone who decided that I didn't want to kill people for the rest of my life. I didn't want to have that as my career. So anyway, after Desert Storm ended, I turned down my commission, and I took a lot of heat from that. But I'm really glad I did. I, now, I, people say to me, Pete, you had a sweet spot. You were guaranteed a slot as a fighter pilot. Why did you turn it down? I'm like, I kept my soul. I'm so glad I kept my soul. I got out of the Marine Corps, and when I left the Marine Corps, I swore I'd never work for the government again, because it just sickened me. And... My next biggest step towards libertarianism, like, I, I've always been sort of like a, a libertarian mindset. I've never liked people telling me what to do or where to be, what not. It's just, and I don't like the government telling me that I have to pay them X amount of taxes, I have to do this for them, whatever. But I guess maybe my next biggest step towards libertarianism was about four years ago. I'm working for 
what I think is a, a private company. And I think I'm doing a lot of work for a private company. I'm going to find out later on that I'm actually working for some governments without my knowledge. I became really upset. That was when I decided I was going to do something about it, and I started running for office. I formally joined the Libertarian Party about three or four years ago, and I started running for office. I started running for what's called Bergen County Freeholder. A freeholder is a legislator at the county level here in New Jersey. Right. And I ran twice. I ran in 2015. I ran, I think I got about four or 5,000 votes, and in uh, 2016 that doubled my vote count. I was happy with that. And this year, I really had the intention of taking the year off. But my party asked me to run, so I threw my hat in the ring, and March 11th, through our convention, I was, uh, was honored enough to be able to take the, the, uh, the nomination to represent my party, to represent them as uh, the Libertarian candidate for governor. Well, let, me, let me jump in with a question here. You raise a very important point. Now, you've run for office twice. Um, you've made a considerable amount of progress. You've gotten the name recognition. Uh, folks have been... Uh, treated to your political philosophy, uh, again, a better understanding of Pete Warren. Why is it important to run as a libertarian and not as a Republican or not as an independent? Why is that so important to you? I could not possibly run as a Republican. I couldn't run as a Democrat. It's just not in me. I've had, through the, my past two campaigns when I was running for a freeholder, plenty of times I've had ranking members of the Democrat and the Republican Party ask me, please run for us. I turn them down flat. I just can't do it. I am not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. There might be some issues that I agree with them on both sides, but I am not that. I am a libertarian. To me, Democrats, Republicans, even parties like, like the Green Party, they're parties of control. What they want to do is cast a bunch of laws, have police point guns at your head, and force you to do things that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. That's not me. I learned that about myself when I was 19 years old. I don't want to be able to, I don't want to force people to do anything. That's just, it's just not right. It's not my character. So to answer your question, no, I could never run as a Republican. I see there are quite a few people that either have uh, their libertarians in the Republican Party or small libertarians in the Democratic Party and they try to make an impact, but those are anomalies. So if you look at somebody like, like uh, Rand Paul, Rand Paul is an anomaly in the Republican Party. And I love him, I do, I, th I think he's a great man, but I could never do what he does. Like, he's lucky enough where he's, he's developed like this niche market in the Republican Party where he is the well-known libertarian. I can't run as Republican, especially in, in New Jersey. New Jersey we have what I call blue Republicans or rhinos. They're really not Republicans. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll claim that they're all for like the Second Amendment, to right. just take their vote. I'll give you an example. The town I live in, I live in a town called Gramsci, New Jersey. It's a small town, might be 15,000 people or so, and it's a well-off town. The, the town council consists entirely of Republicans. There's not a single Democrat in there. There's not even a Democrat party in the town of Ramsey. Now, there is a, a small businessman who bought a sizable piece of property in town, and he's determined to build a gun range and a gun shop. Well, all of these Republicans, or so-called Republicans, they decided that they were going to put up as many walls as possible in this man's way to prevent him from building a gun range in their town. I don't understand that. These are supposed to be Republicans. Republicans are supposed to be uh, the representative of the, the NRA. They're not doing their job, especially here in New Jersey. In New Jersey, the NRA, sort of like in cahoots with the, with the Republican Party, whereas Republicans take the Second Amendment vote for granted. I can't do that. I'm out there campaigning hard for the rights of people who are in favor of the Second Amendment. Right. And which just goes on and on and on. Another reason why I can't run as a Republican is because the Republican Party here in New Jersey is just about dead. They're just not doing well. They, their entire campaign is trying to steal votes from Democrats. Mm -hmm. That's not working. If you look at Kim Godano, the Republican I'm running against, she's the lieutenant governor now, and she's running for governor. Her campaign consists of going from the left all the time. 
And at times, she tried to claim that in her New York Times interview, she tried to claim that she was libertarian. She's nowhere near libertarian. <laughs> I, love, I love when Republicans try to be libertarian. Um, I, one of the focuses of this show is on the First and Fourth Amendments, and, uh, or as I like to say, the amendments that Republicans have chosen to forget. Um, you know, until, until a Republican comes along that actively denounces uh, Donald Trump and his anti-constitutionalist ways uh, and his anti-crony corporatist ways, um, they, they can no longer really be taken seriously as a party of freedom. Um, you know, you, you, and then, of course, doing what you're doing, how can you build a truly libertarian message in a party like the New Jersey Republican Party? I mean, it can't be done. Can't be done. They, they don't want to hear it because they're, they're like, like I said, you can call them small R Republicans because ah. they're really, they're like, they're Democrats pretty much. They're, they're moving more and more towards socialism. Let's look at the Kim Bodano, the woman I'm running against. One of, her, okay, the big, one of the biggest problems in New Jersey are property taxes. They're right. through the roof. They're probably pretty bad in Rhode Island, Connecticut, but in New Jersey, they're through the roof. Mm -hmm. And people are sick and tired of it. Her answer to addressing property taxes is to put a, a, a tax cap on there that if you can't afford to pay your property taxes, well, then we'll get your neighbor to pay them for you. I don't understand that. That's socialism. That's not part of the Republican platform, but yet they're implementing this. So this is good for us as libertarians because now if they want to try to steal the, the leftist pl platform of socialism, we'll just stay strong on our uh, fiscal uh, being fiscally conservative and we'll just take all the people from the Republican Party who are looking to have their, uh, looking to have their, their party represented in, in a uh, fiscally conservative way. We will take those votes. It's fine. I'll take them. Oh, absolutely. All right, let's, let's talk issues. Um, first off, I mean, in, in, in every state, you've got a variety of challenges. There's commonality, but clearly on a state-by-state -state basis, they differ in importance to, um, to folks who are residents. So what are, what are the biggest issues challenging folks who live in New Jersey right now? The biggest challenge folk, uh, folk, uh, people in New Jersey are hit with right now is, because, is that they don't want to vote Democrat nor Republican. They don't. If you look at all the major polls, people in New Jersey, even if you're registered Democrat Republican, they don't want to vote for their own people. Because in New Jersey, we have this culture of corruption when it comes to politics, and people are sick of it. The biggest challenge is educating people that there is a viable third choice. Mm -hmm. Now, me running as a libertarian, it's very difficult. You know, it goes by word of mouth, it goes by Facebook, it goes by signs, t-shirts and whatnot. The word is slowly getting out there. I'm doing interviews all the time. I've been on TV a few times the past couple weeks. I've done national radio shows. I've done the Wilcam Majority a few times the past, uh, past few weeks. And it's helping. People are starting to pay attention. But there are some people who really refuse to actually embrace what we're presenting to them. I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's go back to the Second Amendment issues. In New Jersey, many of the people who are gun owners, gun enthusiasts, there's plenty of them in New Jersey, that uh, they don't want to... They don't want to cast their vote for me. Now, Kim Godel, the Republican I'm running against, she's point out said that she's not going to do anything to relax the tyranny that's being imposed upon the Second Amendment people. And I flat out said that if I'm elected on inauguration day, I'll be using mass pardon powers to get rid of most of the New Jersey gun law pro proactively and retroactively on inauguration day, getting rid of the ridiculous gun laws and refer to just federal only. Vermont is a state that is, is virtually federally only, and I have to bring us right back there. For all the, like, there are countless reasons. I give you like case studies. Uh, here's a good, here's a good example. We're talking about the Second Amendment, like this is one of my, my, my pet peeves of Second Amendment. I'm sorry if I keep going on and cut me off here. No worries. But okay, in New Jersey, to legally purchase a firearm, you need to go through a, a vetting process that's unbelievable. It goes above and beyond what the federal government does, but not really. It's kind of like a duplication process. We have to go, the, the process is you go to your, your local police chief, mm -hmm. you apply for what's called a firearms ID card, and by the state statute, the chief of police has 30 days to get back to you with a positive or negative result. And in the state statute, there's no penalty for the police chief to not return the investigation. So, Many times you see police chiefs 
dragging these investigations on for eight, nine, ten months. It's not unheard of. It happens. Look, get wrong. There are some police chiefs out there that are pro-Second Amendment, and they'll get this stuff done in two weeks. They're out there. But I know of a guy who lives in Fort Lee, New Jersey, who um, he was waiting ten months just for a move of address. Now, you need these firearms ID cards for everything. If you want to go hunting, it has to be in your person. If you want to go to, to the fifth range, it has to be in your person. Now, there's no concealed carry in New Jersey. You can't do it at all. Mm -hmm. But, like, the very few uh, protections we have are with that firearms ID card. Now, getting back to, like, my, my case here, about two years ago, there was a woman who lived in Berlin, New Jersey. Her name is Carol Bone. And Carol Bone was going through an abusive relationship. She decided to get out of it. And she does what all women do in New Jersey who are victims of domestic violence. They go out and they get a restraining order. Now, you and I both know a restraining order is nothing. It's right. not going to protect the woman. It's not going to protect anybody. It's the, the only person a restraining order protects is the judge's credibility. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, Carol Bowen, she goes out and she goes to the local police chief and she applies for a pistol permit. Well, she applies. She goes through the whole process because she's a, a law-abiding citizen and she's beyond the 30-day period. Now, the police chief does not return an investigation. We're almost double time. It's almost like 60 days and she doesn't get her pistol permit back. And would you know it, she gets murdered in her front driveway by her ex-lover with her daughter looking out from the front door. These are tragedy stories that I can't stomach, that gets me enraged, that this is why I'm ready to say when I'm elected, I will use pardon powers on inauguration day because I'm sick and tired of law abiding citizens becoming victims because of the, the, the ridiculous laws that Democrats and the Republicans have coerced together to put together to, to create more tyranny upon us. All right, I know. I'm sorry. I, I'm getting no. up right here with the Second Amendment. No, no, that's this is this is why you're here. This is your hour. Uh, you know, these it's important that folks get get an understanding of the candidate. Uh, and listen, libertarians, we actually have a belief system. I, I always use the uh, the story a few years back uh, when Obama cleaned the clock of the Republican Party. The Republican Party very publicly got together to come up with a formula to a make them electable and b in their own words to develop a core belief system so that they could advocate for. And as I like to point out, if you don't have one and you have to develop one, you probably shouldn't be running the government. Because if, in the absence of any belief system, if you have to conjure one up that's going to have mass market appeal, we're all in trouble. So quite frankly, I love the fact that 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 you, Corey Watkin, Jason uh, Justin, Justin O'Donnell was on. All you, all you are emotionally charged about the issues you care about. Yeah, how can we not be? We're libertarians, but most libertarians I meet that are running for office, they're very passionate people. Maybe why? Because we've been pushed around for so long, we can't take it anymore. No, it's, you know, it's we're, we're like bursting at the seams, ready to make it to that next level. Now, how, what's the what's the economic environment like right in, in New Jersey? Is New Jersey successful economically? Are are folks um, you know. Now, they'll, they'll, they'll paint whatever picture they need to to make it look rosy and great, but it really is horrible here. There are corporations leaving in droves. Mm -hmm. Patterson, Camden, Newark, Passaic, all like the major cities are economically depressed. Uh, Camden has no police force. Their, their, their police force is gone, and they're now resorting to using um, the, uh, the county police force to patrol the streets. It's bad here. Now, some of the, like, it's, as bad as it's been for decades in like the inner cities, it's starting to get bad like you know the white person's neighborhood too. Let me give you an example about that. Mercedes Benz had their corporate headquarters in New Jersey, mm -hmm. in Montville, New Jersey, a beautiful town, right. well to do. They had a giant campus setting here. Now they were paying in excess of one million dollars a year in property tax. That's not corporate tax. That's not federal income tax. That's just the right to own the property in Montville and have their headquarters there. Mm -hmm. Well, they got sick of paying that type of money, and they up and left. I think they went to Atlanta. I'm not sure if they left, but they took a thousand jobs with them. Now this story is playing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And my tax plan. This might be a good segue to my tax plan. My tax plan addresses this perfectly. My tax plan addresses so many things. We could probably spend maybe like a whole half an hour on my tax plan if you want. Have at it. Let's let's get into your tax plan. No problem. Okay. My tax plan, it's like no tax plan ever explained before. Mm -hmm. Now, to briefly lead into it, like my, um, my Democratic competitor, Phil Murphy, he's going to raise taxes. 
one of his other pet projects too. He wants to create a public bank. We can hit that one too in a little bit. But, but, but wait, um, wait, 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 let me jump in for a second. Wasn't New Jersey one of the early adopters of the quote unquote millionaires tax? Um, and didn't that essentially bleed the state of, of, of investors? I mean, wasn't that a complete disaster? Yes, yes. We have one of those too. And a lot of our millionaires are leaving the state and taking all their income with them. It's, right. it's, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot when you do that because uh, this tax revenue that could come in from these people, gone, sorry, see it. They moved to Atlanta, they moved to Alaska, or wherever they moved to Delaware or whatever. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So my tax plan, let's get back to that. Right. My tax plan, it's more than just a tax plan. It's more of like an economic plan. It's more of like adding an additional check to the balance of political power. And, you know, most state legislators, or I'm sorry, most state uh, governments have an executive branch, a legislative branch, and, and a judicial branch. Mine is a new level where we're going to actually introduce a level where the people themselves can actually take part in the democracy. Now, under my plan, we're going to be introducing a constitutional amendment that eliminates every single tax in New Jersey, every single tax and fee that the state, the county, and municipal government charge for. Now, that includes that we have an income tax here. It's like 3 or 4%. It's not much. Property tax is huge. That's going to go away under my plan. Gas tax. People don't realize how much you're paying in gas tax, but 37 cents a gallon, it adds up to be thousands of dollars at the end of the year. There's other taxes involved, too. Like, if you want to talk about sin taxes, you want to talk about even having a beer. It's a three-quarters of your beer price in New Jersey is going to be taxes. Uh, my tax plan will also do away with, like, vehicle registration fees. All of this stuff will get rid of and replace what I call fiscal democracy. Now, I call fiscal democracy because it, it's like... It's more of an extension of, of, of democracy. You know, like right now, we, we practice our um, republic with what's called representative democracy. We elect leaders. We're supposed to represent our policy, and uh, we trust them. Well, we're supposed to, but anyway. In a real democracy, everybody takes part in. But under my plan, we can't have everybody take part in everything. It's going to be just fiscal democracy. Where we're going to change it so this way it's going to be a flat tax statewide. It's only an income tax. Corporate taxes are done away with, property taxes are done away with, it's just a flat income tax across the board. The flat income tax will be 10% on anybody who lives in the state or, get, or earns income from the state. And once you have this 10% income tax, you have the ability, where it comes like you know, the volunteerism I like to put into it, you have the ability to appropriate those, those tax dollars to whatever government program you deem fit. So let's say, you have kids in school and you want to, like, say, let's, 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 for academic purposes, let's say you make $100,000 a year uh -huh. and you have to spend $10,000 and give to the government. You can give $5,000 to your local school district. You can give $1,000 to your county park system. You give $2,000 to the infrastructure program. And you could just, if you want to put it into a general fund somewhere, go ahead. And then once you specifically allocate those funds by the same constitutional way to implement this, the same constitutional amendment will bar all legislators from reappropriating. So once you specifically appropriate something, legislators cannot unappropriate it. Now there's a lot to it. You can ask all the questions you want about this, but we, we, people would love to learn more about it. So feel free, ask some questions about it if you like. But the only time that legislators will, under this new plan will be able to appropriate funds directly is when people put money into the general funds. So there'll be a general fund at the state level, general fund at the county level, and a general fund at the municipal level. And only when money is, is in those accounts can legislators at those levels reappropriate downwards only? Mm -hmm. Interesting. And where, where, did, where, did, where did this, what was your uh, inspiration for this? I've been thinking about this. It's one of those thought experiments I've been having for the past like two years or so. Mm -hmm. And since I decided to run for governor, it started to ramp up. It was like one of these things that I, it was a theory I had in the back of my mind for about two years. And I would always like bring it up in conversation, especially with like libertarians or people who are economists, um, people that are actually in politics, public employees. And for about two years, I've bounced it off people and try to get their input, like, what do you think of this? What do you think this would fail? What do you think would break? And I'd use their input to help me strengthen it, or I was also looking to see somebody actually break it entirely so I could just throw it away, because mm -hmm. it was at that point just a theory. But now I'm looking at it, after two years of examining it, it looks like more than a theory. It looks like something that is extremely viable and could be the precedent for government throughout the world. Imagine if we implement a government like this in New Jersey where everyone in New Jersey has the right to vote with their dollar. Mm -hmm. If you don't like this arts endowment program the state puts out, you don't have to put your money in there. But if you like your school district, you can put your money in there. And this allows people to vote for things that they find value in. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. If, imagine if we get this going in New Jersey, 
It'll catch on like wildfire through the other 50 states. And it might even catch on internationally. Hmm. The, um, the war on drugs in New Jersey. You know, you've got a number of difficult inner city environments, but you've also got this opioid plague that doesn't respect economic boundaries. It doesn't uh, respect racial differences. It respects no one. What, what's your approach to the war on drugs? And what do you, what, what's appropriate for government to be, how do they react to it? There's different things you can go at this one. The war on drugs, to me, is absolutely horrible because if you think about what's going on, mm-hmm. having an addiction, whether it's an addiction to heroin, any kind of opioid, prescription drugs, or, or marijuana, to me, this is a medical condition. Mm-hmm. If you are putting drugs in your own body, you're not harming anyone but yourself. I am of the mindset where I believe that my person, my body, I own my entire body. And I have every right to put it to my body, anything I want. Now, some people think that, like, Democrats and Republicans think they have the ability to have some control of your body. I, I don't know. But anyway, the whole war on drugs, to me, it's, it's a farce. I, it seems to be more like a way to prop up government, to give them more power, to give them more rights to throw you in jail or whatever. All right, get back at anyway. Being in control of your own body is something that I hugely believe in. You can't, like, if you're harming yourself with drugs, that's not the government's business. Now, you can take pity on people, definitely. I, I do. I know plenty of people who've gone through addiction problems. I have family members who've gone through addiction problems. And, yeah, we take care of our own. We do what we can to help people. But when it comes to the war on drugs, there are two demographics of people who are injured most by the war on drugs. The number one demographic of people that are injured by the war on drugs are obviously the people that are incarcerated for having an issue. If you have a heroin issue, heroin addiction, marijuana addiction, whatever, you're thrown in jail. You're not hurting anybody, but you're going to be thrown in jail for seven or eight years. And a lot of times, the prosecutors will say, hmm, well, you're a low-level user. Let me get you to roll over on your drug dealer, and then we'll let you go. That's no prize for somebody who has a problem, because now... Instead of doing a, 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 a spin in jail for seven or eight years, now they're looking at a death sentence from some drug dealer in the street. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to see this entire war on drugs end because it's not doing anybody good. Now, the second demographic, believe it or not, try to take a guess. Who do you think is the second most injured demographic in a war on drugs? Take a guess. Hmm. The second most? Um, family members of the uh, folks who... That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, ironically, the police who are forced... Yes, system. yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's the police. Nobody really understands this. I've spoken to, like, in, during the last um, national convention, I spoke time with, uh, what's his name? I've got his name, Medicine uh, Director of the Law Enforcement Against Prohibition or whatever. He right. sat me down and gave me a long class and opened up my eyes to what police officers are going through. And I saw myself, too, like, back in January, February. Imagine being a police officer, young guy, 31, 32 years old, and every single stop you make, you're not sure if you're going to live through it because you're not sure if somebody in that car is willing to use deadly force to defend themselves against a five-year prison term for having a marijuana cigarette right. or having some opium in a car. Mm-hmm. I, I was pulled over twice in January this past year. Twice was the same exact thing. Now, money, I'm a middle-aged white guy. I usually dress, dress like uh, like business casual or so, so like, I don't generally look like a, a threatening type of person. But still, these two pullovers, Both these officers, identical situations. White officers, approximately 31, 32 years old, approaching my car slowly, just step by step, with their right hand, uh, not on their weapon, but just over their weapon, and approaching the vehicle slowly with extreme caution. And the look in their eye was absolute panic. Thank God I'm a middle-aged man and I know how to de-escalate situations, and I can take it down a notch. Younger men, especially like, like if you're a, a young black youth in the inner city, can you imagine if like you're nerfed up, you're 18, 19, 20 years old, and here comes this white cop with like who's scared shit when he's got like this look in his eye? It's gonna be tough to get out of that situation. A lot of times that's gonna escalate out of control. Anyway, my point is this: if you're a police officer and you're in a job for two, three years, 
and you're doing these pullovers every single day, you don't know if you're going to live through each pullover, of course, you're going to be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder within three years. We are asking our police officers to do a ridiculous job, asking them to fight a war that's in someone's brain. They cannot win this war. The only people that are winning this war, like the losers of this war, are the prosecuted and the police. And who are the winners in this war? The politicians. That's who it is. They keep they stand on their soapboxes and they keep saying, great, we're going to get tough on war drugs, we're going to come up with like, stronger sentences, we're going to give police officers more tools when it comes to fighting law enforcement, we're going to lock these people up, and they're getting all this mileage out of it. The prosecuted and the police are victims. It is time we just end this war on drugs. Now, if I'm elected like governor, it's going to be extremely difficult for me to end the war on drugs because, you know, there's a federal aspect of this thing that's difficult to get around. Now, there are plenty of states who have legalized marijuana through legislative acts, and I'm not sure what Trump, President Trump's going to do. It's going to be interesting to see, like, like how he goes, because in New Jersey, if I were elected governor of New Jersey, I'd instruct my AG, I'd instruct every single police officer, cease enforcing any marijuana laws unless there's a, a youth involved. And it would be interesting, imagine if like, you know, the other states in the Union have enacted legislation to legalize marijuana. Well, we, we have legalized marijuana in New Jersey, but it's, it's really nothing like there are in the other states. You really have to jump through groups, you have to be dying of cancer before you get a card. Uh -huh. So, I'm curious, what would Donald Trump do if I used my executive power to order all law enforcement to no longer prosecute marijuana crimes? I'm interested. I'd like to see what he would do. Would he try to like roll troops in here? Would he try to take away federal highway dollars? I don't know. This is something that we should at least push to see where's this going to go. Or we could ask Steve Bannon what he wants Donald Trump to do. <laughs> the um, yeah. economic development. All right. And folks, let me just mention, take a, a station break here for a second. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Pete Warman. He is the Libertarian candidate to be governor of the great state of New Jersey. Folks, you're listening to The Coalition on the Worldwide Coalition Network, Facebook.com slash The Coalition Radio, on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio, and of course, CoalitionRadio.us. We're broadcasting live here on Friday night at the Go Local Live Media Center, home of the Go, sorry, CoalitionRadio.us Media Empire. Um, Pete, what, what is the appropriate role of government in economic development? to stay out of business, get out of the way. Okay, I'll give you a, an anti-example right now. The Democrat I'm running against, uh, his name's Phil Murphy. He's looking to form, now, Phil Murphy is a former Goldman Sachs executive. Sounds reminiscent of our former governor, Corzine, who was the, another Goldman Sachs executive. Right. We know how that, that story played out. Anyway, Phil Murphy's grand idea when it comes to economic development is to create a public bank to create the Bank of New Jersey, whereas <laughs> he can write as many, I guess, um, high-risk mortgages, maybe even help Goldman Sachs securitize public bonds. I don't know what his intentions are with this thing. But oh, now, Lord. he's going to force this bank on the citizens of New Jersey. Now, what's going to happen when this bank fails? Uh, he's and it, and okay it will. Because he'll probably move out of the state, but the rest of New Jersey is going to be left holding the bag. This is what I call anti-economic development. If he actually gets his bank off the ground, imagine the repercussions of this. Now, we'll have a state bank of New Jersey. What is to stop the legislators of New Jersey to cast laws to benefit their own bank at the, the, the disadvantage of the, all the many uh, private banks we have? Right. Imagine what they can do. You have the control to say, oh, my bank is going to rule. I'm picking the winner in this industry. And it's just me, by the way. Ha ha. Hmm. That's one of the things I'm talking about, like his anti-economic plan. He has no economic plan other than more and more socialism. Uh, Kim Godano's plan, I don't see anyone. When it comes to my economic plan, my economic plan is huge. It goes back to more to my tax plan. When I tell you I'm going to get rid of corporate tax and property tax, those are the two biggest things that are keeping businesses in this state or forcing them to move out of it. Right. If I get rid of those taxes, we would have to build walls around New Jersey to keep corporations out. Because imagine, like, if you're an auto manufacturer or some kind of manufacturer, something like, and like, there's blocks and blocks in Camden that are open, 
Hey, they could buy that up, build any kind of production facility, pay no income tax, I'm sorry, pay no uh, property tax, pay no corporate tax, and get a lot of jobs in. Now, let's also look at the other parts of the economic reproduction, uh, reproduction of that. Imagine, like, in Camden, Patterson, Passaic, all these downtrodden areas. Most of those areas, the biggest economic boost, the biggest, the biggest economic uh, driver in those areas is the drug trade. Mm -hmm. Now, you have generations of kids growing up in these areas who they just see, like, people in their neighborhood, like, like older teenagers that are dealing drugs, and they just fall into it because, hey, they, they, they pull themselves out of school, they don't see any use of it, and it, it's a quick buck, and they can make some money doing it. Now, they know there's violence associated with this trade, especially when it's on the ground. Imagine if all of a sudden, in Camden, after a couple of years of my plan, we have auto production facilities, we have computer production facilities, we have any kind of, like, even, like, fidget spinner production facilities in Camden. Now, if you tell a kid that, you know, 20-year-old kid, if you want to make $80,000 a year tax-free selling drugs, worried about cops, worried about your boss shooting you because you're late for a meeting, or would you rather take a $60,000 a year job with this company in a production line, and you can have benefits, you can have uh, maybe uh, uh, all kinds of other issues, so you get dental benefits, you get medical benefits. One thing that's huge, like a life trafficking drugs isn't much of a life. And they know this. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to better the economic conditions to bring corporations in here to bring jobs in. Government's job is not to create jobs. Every time the government comes up with some ridiculous jobs program, it ends in disaster. Like in New Jersey, we have, okay, if you, you've probably been to Giant Stadium before from, from Rhode Island or from New Jersey. You've probably been to Giant Stadium. Near Giant Stadium, not called MetLife Stadium, whatever, they're building the third iteration of a failed works, public works program. It started out as what's called the American Dream Project, where they floated billions of dollars in bonds, and the developer went out of business and took the money with them, and it just lay dormant for a while. It's like you're talking about uh, probably a thousand acres of land they were going to build like a theme park in. Now the second iteration now, we're, I'm sorry, the iteration we're on now is called uh, the, what's it called? Uh, San Jose, no, oh, sorry, this was called the American Dream. So it's third iteration, same sort of thing. The town that he struggled for floated a $700 million bond for this public works program. All it is is a jobs program, and this project's never going to be, it's never going to produce any fruit. Like, there will never be a theme park there. There will never going to, nothing's ever going to come of it. These are weak and feeble attempts to just keep people busy doing busy work. We need people doing busy work. We need actual production. The government's job is not to create jobs. The government's job is to get the hell out of the way and make sure that there's economic conditions conducive to bringing in corporations. Why? Why the tax plan mm -hmm. will do that? You do away with the property tax, do away with the corporate taxes of New Jersey, all that stuff. People will be coming in in droves. People like not only people not moving out, but like people will be coming in from all over the place. Now we have to do this before other states get win. If we get this plan in place, my plan of doing away with these taxes. If we have this going on for three years, we'll have probably three, four thousand different corporations moving in here. And then the other states will implement it, try to throw them away, but by that time it'll be too late because all these facilities will be built in New Jersey. So that's my economic plan. Bring in jobs to private sector, government, please stay the hell out. No, it's it's astonishing. If there's, if there's one similarity um, between Rhode Island and New Jersey, uh, besides our respective accents, and our, uh, our, uh, <laughs> some of our behavior. It's the fact that both New York and Boston are both in economic dynamos. And yet, for some reason, the um, states immediately adjacent to them, in this case New Jersey, in our case Rhode Island, are both financially in a tailspin. New Jersey's got one of the weakest economies in the nation, yet, literally, I grew up 10 miles from the World Trade Center, 10 miles from the heart of the financial district. Um, it's, it's solely attributable to the governments of each state taxing the environments into, into a zombie-like status. No one in their yeah. right mind at this point is, would move a business into either New Jersey or Rhode Island. You, you either are, you know, unless you're being given some type of crony break. Um, it, it's, it, you know, it, when you talk about uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz in, in Montvale, I mean, you know, I mean, Montville is a 
beautiful suburb. I believe that's exit 171. Um, the, in the northern part, you know that. <laughs> right, there, right, right in the, in the northern north parts of New Jersey, directly adjacent to the, you know, within a few miles of the Tappan Zee Bridge, um, you know, uh, Westchester County in New York. Uh, it's just a spectacular area, immediately adjacent, you know, within a quick 20 minute drive off peak, if you will, a half hour to the, to everything that Manhattan has to offer. Yet the economy, and just like us, we're, we're, a half hour train ride, depending on the day, maybe two hour train ride, but we're, we're immediately adjacent to this economic maelstrom called Boston, and yet Rhode Island is in, in, in a death spiral financially. It's all because of the attempt by each government to engage in central planning, high taxation, gov corporate cronyism, and governments that are wildly out of, out of control, both in terms of their mission and their size. It's, it's, it's brutal to watch, and we're losing entire generations to failed school systems and, 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 and the absence of any real job prospects, uh, like you say, outside of uh, the shadow economies of either uh, drug trafficking or just being simply off the books and off the grid. It's, 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 it really is a human tragedy of, of epic proportion because in the case of Rhode Island, it's, you know, it's a very relatively small area. In the case of New Jersey, New Jersey, I believe, is still the most densely populated state in the nation. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, I mean, is, is the Christie administration at this point, have they just simply given up? And, and, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, you know, it's just you say that. I, I, there was a, uh, I think it was Cat Tim. You know, you know her from Fox News, whatever? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it was her that said it. Um, right after Beachgate, he's sitting there, and he had his comments afterwards. His comment after Beachgate was, well, if you don't like it, you can run for governor, and you can have the House. And at that point, Cat Tim said something like, well, this, here's a picture of a man who has just given up. Just doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And yet there was so much energy early on. A lot of them misplaced, but there was at least, there was, there was, there was an emotional connection, at least at some level, um, to the people. I mean, it, it, is, is it government in general? You know, you take someone like Chris Christie, who was essentially a small town lawyer, uh, who through government connections made it to, you know, to the, the pinnacle, of, I'll call it regional law enforcement, and then was able to parlay that into a political career. Here's a guy who went from a, you know, from a small town to having lost complete connection with every, I mean, his, his approval ratings, incredibly enough, I mean, our governor, Gina Raimondo, is an outright failure here on of epic proportions. She makes, you know, he makes her look great. I mean, this guy is just, he's, <laughs> what, what's the term the kids say? A hot mess? Uh, yeah, uh, he's, he's definitely by far is the, the, the lowest approval rating of anybody I've ever seen. And I, I almost felt bad for him. I don't know if you saw him, he was at a Met game recently. Oh, yeah. He caught a foul ball. <laughs> right. And he caught a foul ball. He high-fived somebody. And he, he did the right thing. He gave the ball to some kid that was sitting next to him. And the entire stadium booed him. <laughs> I, I, I almost felt bad for the guy. Well, the guy's a... Like, well, the, the guy's a... Did the thing with him. The guy's he, a... I, the I heard you before. He... he, he Good. Is that you or me? No, you say it's me. The guy's a Dallas Cowboys fan. What 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 the hell else do you expect? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on. Uh, for the for the record, despite my long term here in Rhode Island, I am in fact a lifelong fan of the New York Football Giants. Um, All right. and, 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 and as I like to say to folks up in here in New England, do you know why the Patriots won the Super Bowl last year? Because they didn't what? didn't have to play the Giants. So, <laughs> and also a philosophical question you can share with my friends in New Jersey, my new friends. Um, it, it, tell them the next time they meet someone from Boston, ask them how does someone catch a football on the top of a helmet. Just ask them that. Um, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> but um, you know, again, so many similarities. Hey, can I go, can I go for one second? Yeah, of course. To get back what you said about Christie before, where, like, when he first came in, when he was first running for office eight years ago or so. You're right. He had some strong rhetoric, and it sounded like he was going to be into like change. But like, here's the thing: Democrats, Republicans, they continue to try to tweak a system that is broken. It's not going to work. Like, whether it's a Democrat or it's a Republican, they just try to manipulate the system slightly to benefit their friends, and that doesn't work. And after time, like, the system will beat you down. And that's exactly what happened to Christie. After eight years being in office, he's getting beat up by Democrats. He's getting beat up by his own people in the Republican Party. 
He's got his own people like closing bridges on him and stuff like that. He's got to deal with. Like he's he's pretty much done. When I'm governor, you know, I guess it's, uh, it's been a little bit more. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself there. When I'm governor, if I'm elected governor, I'm not going to be your typical type of governor trying to schmooze with people. I won't have to. You see, Democrats and Republicans, are, like as I said before, they're all about control. One of the beautiful things now, I'm going to say, like, these idiots, Democrats and Republicans, have gotten together in the past, I don't know, 50 years or so, and they've centralized more power in the governor of New Jersey than it had in any other state in the union. The governorship of New Jersey, you have line item veto. Not many governors have that. You also have the ability of absolute pardon and clemency power. You also have the ability, let's see, what else do you have there as the governor of New Jersey? Uh, you have the ability to appoint every single judge and prosecutor. How many governors can do that? Not many. If I'm elected to go to New Jersey, I won't have to work with the legislature on this law or that law because I'm not focused on creating more control. I'm focused on freedom. And to bring freedom, all I need is line item, uh, line item veto, pardon, and clemency. I won't have to work with the legislatures all day long. Pardon, pardon, clemency, line item veto. It's amazing what you can do with that kind of power. Anyway, everybody out there, if you're listening to the show, here's a quick break. If you like what I'm selling here, and if you're not in New Jersey, just consider the fact New Jersey is probably one of the most oppressed states in the Union. If you can help me turn it around, by God, you're going to see this catch on like wildfire through the rest of the Union. Please, everyone, I beg of you, go to my website, www.p4nj.com. That's P, the number 4, nj.com, slash donate. Go to the donate button. Please, we need to raise money. The reason why we need to raise money is not just for awareness, but to get into the debate. Right, yeah, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to focus on that for a second, because this is, you told me this offline, and this is astonishing. Um, because I'm just going to point out an observation about Rhode Island. Uh, a mere three years ago, uh, a gentleman named Bob Healy, who is since deceased, sadly, ran as a third-party independent candidate for the go in the governor's race. He spent, well, some well, some folks laid out, some personal friends of mine laid out money on his behalf, but on his campaign, Tony Tony Jones, how much did he spend? It was $28. He spent $28 on the campaign. <laughs> he was invited to all the major debates. Tony, what? Tony, of course, Tony Jones, the inimitable, the pompous of love, the the man behind the scenes, the god of all indie media here in Rhode Island. Tony Jones, what percentage of the vote did Bob Healy get? About twenty eight dollars for twenty percent. Now I, I, I in a governor's race. In a governor's race. He threw, he completely changed the dynamics of the election. He completely changed the conversation. And all I can say is whenever his name comes up, damn it, we miss him. Uh, he died <laughs> far far too young he passed. Here's a guy who spent his entire life changing the conversation, as you are too, Peter Armour. Now, how, tell me, what are the financial requirements in the great state of New Jersey to get into a debate? All right, in the People's Republic of New Jersey, the debates are run by the actual state of New Jersey. In many states, you have like League of Women Voters or some other nonpartisan group that runs a, a debate. In New Jersey, no. Democrats and Republicans want to make sure they have their thumb over the top of what's going on, so they have a state agency run it called NJ Elect. Now, to get access to the debates, there's two criteria. One, you have to be on the ballot. I summit, I am. Number two, you have to raise a minimum of four hundred and thirty thousand dollars to have for campaign expenditures. No, wait, 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 wait. wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's emphasize that for a second. I'm going to say I'm going to say this in slowly. Four hundred and thirty thousand dollars for the right of a duly birthed legitimate political organization to simply exercise their free speech in front of in front right. of the state. Four hundred and thirty freaking thousand dollars simply so that you are allowed your right what is your your right as an individual, as a free man or woman, all right, in this nation, in order to debate. You think we got pay to play in Rhode Island? 
<laughs> how do they? First of all, you made. How do they arrive at four? I mean, I mean, four hundred thirty thousand dollars. What? What? How do they arrive at that number? Let's let's not call it my right because it, it's really. I don't want to call it my right to be in a debate stage because it's not. It's actually the right of the people who want to see and hear me. Right. There are thousands. I'm going to get to the, at least a, a hundred thousand people here in New Jersey right now who want to see me on a debate stage tearing up the Democrat Republican. Now, I've got quite a, quite a bit of debate experience under my belt the past few years, and I've really grown to enjoy the sport. And to me, it is a sport. You know, I used to be a football player when I was young. I used to love that. But, like, now I just I really enjoy debating. It's a lot of fun. And for me to get on a debate stage and to require, like, $430,000 to get up there, it breaks my heart because, like, I, I want to get up there. I want to help represent my people. But they're just, they're just so much in the way. So everybody out there, if you can hear me, please. You got a rich relative, knock on his door. Please <laughs> donate. www.pete, the number four, nj.com slash donate. Don't be shy. And, 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 as, <laughs> and, and, and as we said, when our, our good friend Corey was on last week, you know, folks have come become used to the notion of a money bomb. Well, if you're a libertarian, every day is a money bomb. Um, <laughs> you know, and if you're a libertarian nationwide, you know, if you want to upset the apple cart, if you want to challenge the status quo, if you want to get in people's grill, listen, I can go on with, Tony can tell you, I can go on with cliches for hours, but if you want to get in people's pie hole, if you want to be right and play smash mouth politics, then imagine in a state as densely populated as New Jersey, where there is so much at stake and it's simultaneously so much wrong, what we could do is if every person who vote, voted for Gary Johnson in this last election sent Pete a couple of bucks. Literally everyone. Just, you know, go up on a Pete's website, send him five bucks. You could do some damage. You could do some damage. And that's what I mean about the Mark Wicks moment, because what we need to do as libertarians is understand not the challenge, the opportunity that we have as a movement, a philosophy, a political party, regardless of how you self-describe yourself as a libertarian, minarchist, anarchist, Big L, small L, I don't care. We have opportunity here to change the world. And all it takes is a little bit of extra effort. And I'm asking you to do it for a bunch of people. So listen, a little bit from all of us to the group of people that we've been identifying over the last few weeks now, folks who are going to join us in the weeks to come, you help them out. You change the world. All of a sudden, we're not having Facebook arguments. We're having arguments on major network television. We're not just going from a couple of isolated events on Fox Business News. God bless Fox Business News last year for hosting Gary and the crew. All right, But we're all of a sudden part and parcel of the everyday political conversation. We are not some quirky anachronism anymore. We are not some isolationist. We get a chance finally through people like Pete Warman to define ourselves to the nation. We no longer have to be allowed to take the definition that is pushed upon, hurtled upon us. Right? It is our time. This is, to me, as important as the, the last election was, this is the true libertarian moment because of people like Pete. Listen, Pete, I, uh, God bless you for what you're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's Thank you. No. I need the prayers, man. It's going to wear on me this campaign. No, no. It's listen. It's an incredible effort. You know, when you look at you know, folks from Rhode Island. You know, we complain about driving down to Westerly for the day. You're looking at states as densely populated in New Jersey as you know, as just as on a size basis as huge as Texas for people like Corey Watkins. If you're looking about challenge, having to fight your way through the Boston media, like my friend Mr. O'Donnell up in, up in New Hampshire, if, if, you, if you look at the type of institutionalized, uh, 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 I was going to say, candidacies of people like Claire McCaskill in Missouri, if you look at states like New York, like where Larry Sharp is going to do battle against truly an evil empire, if you look at states like Maryland, like Arvind Vora, who's, you know, love them, you know, it depends on the day how you feel about the type of <laughs> bombs Arvin has thrown out there. But he is a highly principled libertarian, all right, of the, of, of the highest order. Hell. Passion is all hell. Imagine what difference he could do in Maryland. These are the people that you're meeting on a day-to-day -day basis. We're gonna, you're going to see in New Orleans. You're going to see four years from now who are making a difference and why it's critical, critical to get out there and show them some love. And I don't mean Facebook love. I mean the do re me. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, PP, give them give them the website one more time, and just one more time, tell them how much money you need to get into the debates. People, I need four hundred and thirty thousand dollars to get into the debate. Jeez. It's a lot of money. But as Pat was saying, if everyone in New Jersey that voted for Gary Johnson is about seventy-two thousand of you, if all of you put in twenty bucks, we got it. The website is www.pete4nj.com slash donate. P-E-T-E, the number 4, nj.com slash donate. Don't be shy. Get your uncle to donate. If everyone donates 20 bucks, we're in it, and you will, I'll give you a debate performance you will never forget, I promise. God bless you, man. Listen, folks, Pete Roman, candidate for the governor of the great state of New Jersey. Listen, I want, I want two things. I want the tape from the convention, and I want a picture of you lounging on a beach chair at Island State Beach Park, okay? That's, that's my, my, my personal request, and I'll pay for the privileges, okay? Okay, I will get you the recording. I think Jay might have it, and I have a picture of me at a beach. I'll send it to you as soon as we get done here. Okay. Also, and my apologies. I really had the intention to make it up there. I tried to, but the, just traffic was just unbearable. I left the city at 3 o'clock. I'm oh sorry. I figured that uh, a, a three-hour ride, I could have easily done in four hours, and I left the next hour in there. It was going to be five and a half hours. I'm sorry. I had to come back. No, no. Listen, really to come with me, listen, the door is open. I think what, you, what, what folks need to do, it's kind of like a... Um, I'll horrify people with this, but remember when American Idol contestants went on tour? I think what you guys need to do is you need to get Larry and you and Alicia and Corey and, and a whole bunch of people in a bus and just hit the road, Partridge Family That's style. That's a good idea. Partridge Family style, spend a week or two, you know, tra traversing this great nation, spread the gospel to libertarian party groups and affiliates all over this great nation, and just... You know, let, let's, folks, let's generate some damn excitement because, you know what, I have never been prouder to be working with and in conjunction with and supporting the group of candidates that we have right now at both the state and the federal level in this party right now. It's, it's fabulous. And, and again, Pete, thanks so much for coming on the show. And thank you for seeking me out. Thank you for this opportunity to you. All right. We'll talk soon. Wow. All right. I'll send you a photo. <laughs> thanks, buddy. Four hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So you have a you have to pay for the right to free speech. And folks, you thought Rhode Island sucked. No. <laughs>